Well, hello, my far-flung students, wherever you might be. This is parts two and three combined of the lecture set on employment and unemployment for Economics 53 in the spring 2020. I held this up a little bit because I wanted to get some of the topical information in this, and I've managed to do that now so we can move ahead. So let me talk about how I've changed our plans here just a little bit, not a lot. I do hope you're all doing well in these trying times. Uh, I can't imagine where you all are and what you're up to. I suppose you're finding trying to deal with the different ways that course material is coming at you uh, very, uh, finding that a bit challenging, I would guess, in the same way that the teachers are finding big challenges in other ways. But try to be patient with this process. I'm going to send out an audio file not long after I post this up. And again, we are going to uh, remedy the grades a little bit in the class to make sure you're not uh, going through grade stress. And I've already described in emails to some extent how I'm going to do that, but I do want to remind you that that is in fact in the works. Nonetheless, we are going to take a little quiz sort of exam online as before, but not as difficult. And I'm going to say more about that at the end of this video by example, actually. Uh, I think that's sometime next week. I've, I've uh, updated the, the course calendar. Of course, that depends on when you look at this. I didn't announce the live stream of this. You can look at this archive anytime you want. But we'll have a, another exam and then a final, and um, so that we'll try to keep the course as normal as possible. Let's get into this slide set, though, right now. Now, previously, uh, I said we would talk about, we, we already did point one, employment and unemployment in numbers and some topical, and then we uh, are supposed to disaggregate employment here. And then I was going to use the third set to talk about earnings and income and wealth distribution, but I'm putting that off and want to talk about unemployment issues solely. So I'm changing the plan here, and I have consolidated this lecture as two. So there's going to be uh, parts two and three are going to be included in this. So um, here's what we've here's what we were planning to do: employment, unemployment, and numbers. And then this lecture, we start by disaggregating unemployment and talking about who is unemployed. And then we're going to end this with theories of unemployment, uh, which will be described as frictional, structural, cyclical, and one that I've added: the kind of unemployment that is associated with a shocking rare event. And so. That's the difference. Part three has changed a little bit from the original intention. Let's get to topical issues first. I'm sure you heard this news. This was big news last Thursday uh, at 8.30 in the morning. And so the Department of Labor announced that initial jobless claims, uh, what they technically refer to as unemployment insurance weekly claims, but the media calls it initial, job, initial jobless claims, um, the only time I speak is when I'm speaking on videos. I talk a little bit to my wife here at home, so every time I start a video, I can, can barely pronounce my words. Um, for the week ending March 21st, this has about a 10-day lag. It came in at 3,283,000, as they say, up 3,001,000 from the previous week. Now, the media reported that the previous record was 900 or so thousand, but the previous record actually was 1,073,500 on January the 9th, 1982. And that's because the media was looking at seasonally adjusted data. But I looked at non-seasonally adjusted data because that's what this is here that we're looking at. Uh, this number, 3,283,000, is going to be muted quite a bit when they seasonally adjust it just because of the way the math works. But this actually is the true count. So sometimes the seasonally adjusted data doesn't make any sense in the data series. And this is one place where it doesn't. Now let's take a look at the past to see how large this number is compared to the past. I did that in one previous video. In fact, I did it in the first video, but I was using other people's data. So I went to the Department of Labor and uh, pulled down the weekly data myself. And unfortunately, they have non-seasonally adjusted data only going up to about 2007. So if you want to use the long-term comparison, as we do here from 1967 up until 
just a few days ago, then you have to use seasonally adjusted. And that's where the media got their number from. But as you can see, if you look at the chart before the release last Thursday, that the high number reported there was uh, sometime back in 1980 or 81, and is at a peak of, it looks like about 675 or 680 or 690,000. And then it was nearly matched again when we got to the last recession in um, 2008. Well, of course, I have a little inset over there that shows where the most week, uh, the most recent weekly line would go. I just actually stuck it in there. It's not even scaled properly, I don't think. So you, you say, well, if the highest of the, uh, at least the adjusted rates was uh, under 700,000, and then all of a sudden you have one at 3.2 million, uh, that's going to make the data look awfully peculiar. Well, that's the circumstances. This is really peculiar that nothing like this has ever happened before. It is, of course, mostly the effect of the pandemic, but there's also honestly, a kind of media or social media effect that is amplifying this quite a bit. I don't know if you've noticed it, but there's no news on except news of the pandemic. I subscribe to the Los Angeles Times. I think they had one article in the entire paper that was not about the pandemic, which is really starting to irritate me because other things are going on in the world. There's the new ceasefire in Afghanistan. There's a, not long ago, North Korea was once again launching short-term missiles into the Sea of Japan. None of that's in the paper. It's just coronavirus. So, of course, with this kind of focus uh, and with this capacity to get out the word that you need to do this, you can't do that, then there's a very strong sort of herd-like behavior that we see here that's never been seen before. And to some extent, that does explain this. There have obviously, in history, been pandemics before, although it's certainly been a while in the United States, although not in Asia. And uh, obviously, if you go back and take a look at the history of the 1918 influenza, which actually was a three-year influenza that went from 1917 to 1919, you say, uh, well, it took weeks for people to get information about that. And so, of course, the influenza was much more deadly because there was not much of a discussion in adequate time to tell people uh, what to do, except in large cities. Now, of course, you can pick up your phone, you can pick up your computer, you pick up a newspaper and have all the information that uh, people are trying to get to you. And so there is, to some extent, a media effect here, I think. OK, so we'll watch this. This does imply that there's going to be a substantial increase in the unemployment rate uh, because this data that we're looking at right here, this previous data, is... Uh, a leading indicator. It's the very first claim for unemployment. So these people will be on unemployment. The allowance for unemployment has been increased to include people who have not paid unemployment insurance. And I'm going to say a little bit about that in the next lecture. I needed to get this out in a timely way, so I didn't have time to look all of that up. But um, we'll see here in just a minute that we're estimating an unemployment rate that also is at record levels. So you may remember in the last slide set, we stopped with the unemployment rate, and I pointed out to you that there's actually kind of two unemployment rates and that we uh, should take a look at the other one as well. So this is our opportunity to do that. The, it's kind of a hidden statistic called the U6 or special unemployment rate. And so as it says here, the Department of Labor determines the size of the civilian labor force and the percentage of that labor force unemployed by doing a monthly survey. It is not determined by the number of people collecting unemployment insurance. So that statistic I just cited, initial unemployment claims, which is for unemployment insurance, uh, is associated with the unemployment rate, obviously by statistical association. One doesn't directly lead to the other. The unemployed are defined as those who declare that they have actively looked for work in the last four weeks. So you remember that about the unemployment rate. The count is the numerator and the civilian labor force is the denominator. But they ask another question in the survey when they do it. They determine whether the respondent is, quote, neither working nor looking for work, but indicate that they want and are available for a job and have worked, have looked for work sometime in the recent past. Some of these are classified as persons marginally attached to the labor force, 
although I think it's more appropriate to just call them the long-term unemployed. When this number is added to the numerator and published in obscure table A12U6, it is referred to as the special unemployment rate, and in my opinion, it should be called the real unemployment rate because these people are just as unemployed as those who actively sought work in the last four weeks. Now, when you map the two out, there's a you can see here uh, going back to 1999 up to the present, the red upper one is uh, the U6 unemployment rate and the blue one is the standard unemployment rate. This coming from only 1999. If you look at the average over this time span, the, um, the U6 unemployment rate has averaged actually 10.5%, whereas the blue, the standard, has averaged 6%. Both are relatively low. In February 2020, the upper 7.4%, and as you know, the, the traditional unemployment rate at 35 So the question is, of course, where are these going now? Well, my estimate is that it's hard to say, really, because um, you don't know how quickly people are going to file for unemployment. And the law that um, there, part of the legislation that was passed and signed yesterday, passed the day before yesterday and signed yesterday, uh, gives incentives to employers to be able to borrow money if they don't lay off their labor force. And it's a big loan package. And so it may be that some large employers will simply continue to pay their employees. They can get that loan package only if they retain their employees. So that may affect the outcome of this considerably. It's impossible to know. So we have, therefore, a very wide range of the estimate. But I think the blue will likely go to 15%. It could be as high as 25% with this new incentive. I don't think it'll get that high. Then the red, which is always 4 or 5% higher, and includes the marginally unemployed or those who haven't looked for work or more habitually unemployed, will go to 20 to 30 percent. And if it does that, if they go to the upper range of that, then the unemployment rate will be as high in 2020 as it was in the trough of the Great Depression, but for an entirely different reason. Now, in case you're curious about the U6 unemployment rate and other measures, this slide, as you can see, has the don't worry, be happy notation on it, which means I'm not going to ask you a question about it. But here in this um, layout here, this table A15, they describe measures of underutilization. Uh, the U1, of course, is the standard unemployment rate measure, and the U6 is the most inclusive. There are others as well, and you can read about them if you're curious about them. Some students, especially from other colleges, Colleges are often doing research in areas like this, and so this is kind of an interesting area to do research. Looking at some more statistics, uh, also what matters is average weeks unemployed. And it's not very interesting until you look at the most recent recession and you found out that that recession actually pushed this value way up, uh, especially for the modern era. Take a look at the difference between the 2000 crash and the 2008-9 crash it ended in 2010. And as I say up there in the inset, the, uh, before the double millennium recessions, there was typically less than 15 weeks. Uh, so that would be the average time that people would remain unemployed. But in fall 2012, it finally started dropping below 40 so as you can see here, this number was all the way up to 40 weeks. That was the average weeks unemployed. And so again, we've stressed in this class that the recovery from that recession has by some respects been relatively sluggish, although steady, certainly and lasting for a very long time. Nonetheless, uh, the GDP growth rate has not run up to its characteristic spurt of say three and a half to four, four and a half percent as it typically does in recovery. It's remained low around two to two and a half percent. This also indicated possibly some structural problems in the economy that may in fact return. Now, what we do not want to see happen, obviously, in 2020 um, is we know the unemployment rate is going to at least initially shoot way up because of the mandatory layoffs that uh, of, and shutdown of entire industries, the hospitality industries in general, 
Uh, airlines have severely reduced their operations. Some auto plants are shut down in various parts of the country. You prob probably saw the controversy about the Tesla plant being shut down up in Northern California, and it's shut down now. So, of course, the unemployment rates go to soar, as we've already seen in the initial uh, jobless claims. But the hope is, of course, and it's certainly the hope of the current administration, that once we get over the sort of downside of this uh, epidemic, and that's even somewhat problematic, we're not quite sure <laughs> where the downside starts. China made it look like it's really not too long. Italy's making it look like, oh man, it may go on for quite a long time. We don't know. But at any rate, um, if we begin to get sticky unemployment average weeks as we're doing here, then this is going to turn out to be a really a doozy of a recession. Now, there's not necessarily any reason to believe that this is going to happen, aside from the fact that in the last recession it did, although that is sufficient reason. But we'll just have to see. We'll have to learn. Going back further, this is the FRED data, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, uh, going back to uh, clear to the end of World War II. And so you can see that, again, that 40-week high was not just, you know, high compared to the previous two recessions. It was high to uh, compare to the entire post-war period, which is getting now pretty close to 80 years or so. And so, again, that's a little bit worrisome that that happened in the last recession. We don't want to uh, see it happen, certainly, in this next one. Now, in these lectures, I tend to disaggregate the unemployment numbers because they, they mask a lot. They don't tell you much about who is unemployed and why, but when you disaggregate them, and there's a lot of different ways to do that, I primarily choose uh, three ways to do it. Um, uh, by, as you'll see here, uh, college, not college education, but education, and then race and, uh, and gender. Uh, it breaks out rather differently depending on certain circumstances. So this is current data. This is for February 2020, but of course this is post uh, C19. So again, who knows what this is going to be uh, a year from now or six months from now. But as I say here, this should make you feel better, although the average unemployment rate was uh, 3.5 or so. Then the college degree was only 2.2. Uh, college, but less than a degree, like going to um, college for a couple of years and not getting a degree, 3.7%, just a little above the average. High school only was 5.1%, and uh, no high school diploma at all is 6.8%. So, of course, that kind of makes sense. It's interesting that the no high school diploma number has been rising as the others have been falling as the unemployment rate has been coming down. So uh, therefore your cohort, college degree cohort, uh, has a very low unemployment rate, or did, at least in February 2020. I know, by the way, that this could be kind of a bummer that you're trying to, if you're a graduating senior, trying to find work in the midst of this mess. And so you may not get a job right away. But as I tell students in Econ 104, at least when you start socking away some of your income in your 401k accounts, you're going to be getting good prices for that. So my advice to you, if you've been watching the current videos I've been doing on current events, I've been saying things like this. Once you start your job, then try to maximize your contribution to your 401k because you're coming in or potentially coming in at 2016 and 2017 prices. So you will really benefit. You haven't lost anything because you don't have any investments yet, but you will really benefit from the rise. So when you go to work, this is a time to really be throwing everything into stocks and uh, trying to maximize that amount. And then... We have to assume that the low unemployment rate of college degree students with college degree or employees with college degrees, I should say, will come back. Now, when we look at uh, unemployment by race and ethnicity, it's kind of what you would expect. I have to apologize. You'll notice here in the Asian category, as I say here, for whatever reason, the data did not break down the Asian category by gender. It breaks down all of the others by gender. The data represents unemployment for Asians with no distinction for gender, and that's why it's two and a half, because it doesn't say 
two and a half male and two point or two point four uh, female or two point six male or anything. It's just two and a half. And if uh, you're an Asian student in my class, and that's probably about a third of you, you're just rolling your eyes and say, "Yeah, I know. We've always been invisible. We're still invisible, even to the Department of Labor." And there is, I guess, some truth to that. I can't imagine why in their survey they don't break the Asian component down by gender. It's separated in a separate table all of its own, but it's the only one not broken down by gender. Anyway, when we get to uh, Hispanic at the top, then you can see there's a distinction between females and males. And that's actually reversed Hispanic to black. Uh, the uh, female unemployment rate for Hispanics is a lot higher than the uh, male. And when you get to black, the female uh, unemployment rate for male is much, much higher than um, female. And the female unemployment rate for black is the same as Hispanic. When you get down to uh, white, then of course the male is 3.5% and the female is 2.8%, which I find kind of interesting. Uh, and so it sort of fits the patterns you would guess, at least in terms of... Uh, race, but it doesn't necessarily fit the patterns you would guess in terms of uh, gender. The unemployment rate, as I say here, for 16 to 19 years, gender rate, uh, both genders, all races, is 11.5%. Uh, and that's actually kind of low by the historical standards. So we can make some summary implications here that we will uh, summarize maybe for exam purposes. And let's just go down the list one by one. First of all, the aggregate unemployment rate tells you nothing about the uneven effects of business cycles upon these um, categories. I mean, obviously, the unemployment rate goes up during a downturn and it comes back down in a recovery, but it doesn't really say very much about what happens uh, based upon race and gender and the like. Uh, in terms of employment, the impact of an economic downturn and how it affects you depends upon these variables. It depends upon the educational level and the higher the level, the lower the likelihood of, that should say unemployment, not employment, the lower the likelihood of unemployment uh, or the higher the likelihood of employment. I just wrote that backwards, sorry. The marital status, uh, which I didn't show in the data, but it, it is the case if you're married, you are less likely to be unemployed and uh, there's also a general correlation between marital status and economic well-being, especially when broken down by race, which I didn't show in this data because I had to draw the line somewhere. It turns out, though, that if you're married, you're much less likely to be unemployed than a single. Uh, in race, there's huge gaps in unemployment levels by race, as we saw, especially for blacks and even more for single black men. There is a clear correlation of that, a cross-correlation of that to the educational level. Uh, what remains can probably be explained by discrimination and by environment in which personal development takes place. I think it's a lot harder to train yourself to be gainfully employed if you live just uh, south central Los Angeles than you do in, say, Rancho Santa Fe. Uh, that's the way uh, things kind of work. And so that's obviously going to be a factor in this. And then finally, uh, gender. Uh, this is starting to even out in the modern era. It's not women who are laid off first, but not necessarily in compensation. Uh, I didn't gather data for compensation for this lecture because it doesn't necessarily fit in here, but somewhere along the line, before we uh, bail out of this class, I'm going to try to show you that information. So, generally you want to kind of try to remember these bullet points uh, for the examination. I'm trying to give you sort of elementary things to think about so your preparation for the examination is not so confounding as it is for the bigger developed courses when, you know, everything's kind of under control on the campus. Let's look at the labor force participation rate because it's kind of interesting. You can see that, well, the first of all, the women's labor force participation rate has risen remarkably over my lifetime. I was born two years before this chart begins. This begins in 1948. And the labor force participation rate, even though this is post-war by 1948 for women, was only 32.7%, rising uh, 10 years later to 37.1% and so forth. When it gets to its peak at about 59.8%, and it's been oscillating around that since, when you take a look at the men, 
uh, especially for 1948. The labor force, of course, was really young back in 1948. Uh, the, the age of the economy globally, actually, but also in the United States is is older and older. So the percentage of the population above working age or above, say, the Social Security age, which is 66, uh, maybe it's 67 now, actually, so perhaps 67, uh, is growing and growing and growing over time. And the number of people on Social Security and Medicare is growing, as we'll see in a later lecture. So back then, of course, 86.6% of the male labor force was employed. That has come steadily down as the, the women's part has come up. It has always stayed above the women, and then it sort of again uh, has evened out. And so we can interpret this in the following way. The rise in the female labor participate, participation rate in the 50 years between 48 and 98 is largely explained by the post-war breakdown in the structure of the traditional family, where the husband worked and the wife didn't, encouraged by the active and essential participation of women in manufacturing during the Second World War. I mean, the factories were filled with working women during the war because the men were off fighting in the war. And that tradition, of course, was sort of reversed after the war, but it was very clear that women were going to be joining the workforce gradually, but nonetheless in very large numbers. At the family level, a desire or the necessity of raising family income. It also got to be the point, especially in the last 30 years, that if you don't have two incomes in the family, then your family income may not be enough to live comfortably. So some of this was by necessity, of course. And remember, prior to the Second World War, the economy of the United States was actually largely an agricultural economy. After the war, immediately, more than half the population was still tied to agriculture. And so it wasn't the case that the woman was unemployed. It's just the task that the woman would have on the farm would be different than the task that the man might have on the farm. It was work that was just as difficult and just as long lasting. So as the farms um, gave way to larger farms in the consolidation of agriculture, then um, to some extent that also freed up women to work in the workplace outside of the home. And then of course there's more opportunities for women in the workplace, especially in professions like uh, law, medicine, and college education that has been expanded. Now of course areas like computer science are expanding, uh, more so at least than they were say, uh, when the computer science profession sort of first started about 25 or 30 years ago. So uh, with the opportunity has grown the growth in the labor force. And the decline in the male participation rate that we saw is largely explained by the aging male population, and it's explained through retirement. And the decline of both in recent years has the same reason. So now this is becoming equally true of women. It's stabilizing where it is, but has become volatile because of the growing um, retirement population. But finally, there, there was a rise in both in 2020, and that was explained by a strong economy. Although, of course, if this becomes a recession, which is inevitable, uh, both numbers will likely fall. You may remember that uh, when we talked about the recessions, that we defined a recession to be two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Now, this first quarter might actually have negative GDP growth because March is still uh, running. So we've had about two weeks of shutdown and the like, or at least we started to implement the shutdowns about two weeks ago. So that may actually produce a negative number for the first quarter of 2020. But obviously, if it doesn't, the second quarter is going to be massively negative. And I tend to think, given the timelines I'm reading now about the recovery from the coronavirus and the capacity to get everybody back to work, uh, which won't be, I don't think, as fast as China, because China appears to be using the capacity to test absolutely everybody everywhere all the time as its control for the uh, for controlling the expansion of the virus. We don't yet have that capacity here. We were completely caught unprepared for everything, uh, any kind of pandemic. 
And that's not Trump's fault, by the way. In California, it's much more the fault of Governor Jerry Brown and to some extent even Gavin Newsom. That's been well documented in the newspapers and they're Democrats. So the doctors were saying, oh, we're not set up. We're not prepared. You've got to build these stockpiles back up. And that fell on deaf ears when it was Governor Jerry Brown's deaf ears. It's also, of course, true for Trump. Trump would never spend money on something like this. So once again, you're victimized by complete and utter political failure. We need to conclude this then with uh, some unemployment theory that will give you a chance to think about things. I'm speeding this up to some extent because I want to get into policy. All that remains is policy. And uh, I need to talk about Federal Reserve policy and fiscal policy. You need to be informed about it because it is critically important and topical right now and is requiring a lot of research on my part to make sure I can explain it to you accurately because I don't want to talk about anything that's two weeks old. I want to talk about things that are two days old or even happened today. So... To cap this lecture off, when you take a look in textbooks about unemployment theory, you find these three. So let's again systematically go through it. Frictional unemployment is the kind that does explain uh, about why the unemployment rate just doesn't go to zero. Why it's always going to be at least one and a half or two and a half percent or something like that. Because there are information inefficiencies there is a search process that's expensive and time-consuming uh, and imperfect where those who are seeking employees and those who are seeking employment have to engage in this labor-intensive search process. And because that's true, the unemployment rate will be at 1.5% or 2% for a period of time, or for indefinitely, it's kind of the floor to which it can go. That's improved a little bit by online job searches and the like, and all of these sites, including LinkedIn, that uh, try to put people in jobs, but it's still imperfect. The structural unemployment is the kind that you often see in economies that aren't very well developed, uh, because there's a mismatch between the skill levels needed and those available in a changing economy. And there may be some degree of structural unemployment in this economy because uh, the skills that pay the most, of course, seem to have an acute shortage all the time. And so that might imply that as we move in the direction of automation, the very slow progress made on self-driving vehicles, which is going much slower than people thought, and that's because probably of the limitations of artificial intelligence, much more restrictive than idealists thought they were going to be. So that's been slowed down a lot, but it's still going to happen at some point, even if it is slowed down. And so there's, again, going to be the elimination of certain skill levels. And if the workers who have those skills don't get trained to do something else, then um, there's going to be unemployment resulting because of that. And then, of course, what we really know is when we look at the unemployment numbers, and this is not the current graph, this is one from a few years ago, it's just to remind you, uh, the cyclical unemployment, of course, goes um, Unemployment goes up when the economy goes down, as we saw in the ending graph of the first lecture. Uh, it, of course, can add 5% or more to the unemployment rate, considerably more, actually. We can see here, looking at this old one that ended in 2016, that the low rates were at that time around 4, the high rates were above 10, so they could add 6% or so to the unemployment rate. I'm not quite sure that we want to classify uh, this as a cyclical unemployment, this is a black swan unemployment. A black swan is an event that appears as it is happening to have a six sigma or greater probability, at least in the finance markets, that's how it's described. In retrospect, you'll sometimes discover that it actually was inevitable and was certain to happen, let alone not having a six sigma probability. Uh, because, of course, doctors and, and um and mathematicians, in fact, including the famous Stavros Busenberg from Harvey Med College. On Econ 136, I, I, uh, I posted a link to all those publications about the, the spread of disease. He was a Bayesian statistician. Uh, all of them say, well, it's, it's going to happen. It's, it's, a, it's not, you know, one chance in a million or one chance in a thousand. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, you know, some, and give yourself 30 years. It's almost certain to happen. And, of course, they were right. 
So the black swan only looks like a black swan when it's happening. But at any rate, this um, impact upon employment, unemployment is so peculiar and so statistically outside of the limits. Again, that uh, initial claims number, if you were to take the standard deviation of all those years and all of that, that would be a 10 sigma event. It doesn't mean that it really is in a Gaussian sense a 10 sigma event because that's actually basically impossible. But what it means is if you think you have a normal structure and you understand it and you estimate its variance and then its standard deviation, then an event happens where it is equal to 10 of those standard deviations. And that's a sense in which it's a black swan or a 10 sigma event. So, of course, that wreaks havoc upon the economy. Now, I'm starting a new practice for you in both Econ 53 and Econ 136 to make your exams easier and so I can make the exam uh, construction simpler. I'm going to end each lecture segment. I didn't do it for the first because I hadn't made this method up yet. So this is for both part one and part two, three. Uh, but in the future, every little lecture will have this at the end. Key takeaways that you should understand. And you, this is a the lower division course, so I say should. In Econ 136, I say must <laughs> because we're building that from a foundation. So let's go through these systematically. And this is what you need to keep in mind as you prepare for our little quiz on this segment. So what is the importance of the initial jobless claim statistic? You know, what does that actually indicate? And what do recent releases indicate for the future? Two, what is the importance of the change in non-farm payroll statistic? That's from the first lecture. That's an important one, too, and that's coming up before long, and that's going to be possibly a shock to the market. What does it measure, and what is a typical pre-crash value? Because, once again, the values we're going to see were going to be probably record setters on the downside. So go back and review that, at least before the quiz. And then regarding the official and the U6 unemployment rate, what is the difference between them? And what is the typical range for the official rate? And when does it peak? Remember, it doesn't peak at the, at the, at the peak of the business cycle, or the, uh, excuse me, at the trough of the business cycle. It peaks at the very end of the trough of the business cycle, or even actually past that trough. It sometimes peaks well into the recovery. So we made that point last time, too. Uh, when it comes to average weeks unemployed, what was peculiar about the last recession? And again, 40 weeks as compared to a 15-week average. Is this going to come back and haunt us this time around? Uh, generally, who is unemployed by race, gender, and educational value? So I think you can kind of remember essentially what that message was there in that segment. And then uh, what clear trends are present in the labor force participation rate that we just took a look at. So, uh, and then finally, the last thing is what are the three components of unemployment theory? So the three uh, fictional, structural, and cyclical. And there's, I'd say there's four, black swan. But I'll only ask you about the three. So these are all the takeaways in summary that you should understand. Now, uh, the PDF of these lecture slides are not only posted on the class website as they have been. I've been uh, trying to figure out a way to get that a little bit more efficient given how I'm having to do this at home. But they're also linked from the actual videos themselves, but they're not linked from the streaming video. After the streaming video is streamed and it sits there for about two hours and YouTube turns it into an archive video, then an hour or so later, or even the next morning, I go in there and find it and I change the description of it and put some different settings on it. Uh, once I do that, then the link for the PDF for these uh, videos is also there. So these slides are available both on the class website and on links from the video. So with all of this, I'm hoping that uh, we can keep this together. Now, we're going to skip over exchange rates, which is the next subject. I'm going to send you an audio file about that. Maybe not tonight because it's getting kind of late, but tomorrow morning, if not tonight, uh, because we need to get into policy. I think the promise I'll have to make you is I will post the exchange rate lecture, which is kind of a luxury in this class anyway, after you graduate or after school is out. 
Uh, I need to do that anyway. I'm taking all these lectures and making them much more formal and posting them up anyway. We have to have enough time for me to cover policy. And the amount of work I have to do is far beyond what I normally do because I have to go read all of the original material on brand new Fed policy. I don't rely upon the media for that. And I'm going to try to bake that into the remaining lectures of this semester so you'll understand exactly what is going on with the uh, new legislation that's passed, with new Federal Reserve policy, its likely impact. You know it's going to generate an absolutely staggering budget deficit, probably about $2.5 trillion. And you said, well, wasn't it supposed to be $1 trillion anyway, and they added a $2 trillion spending bill? Yeah, part of that spending bill is loans and the like, and it won't impact the deficit. But once you, once I sit down and figure out what will, I, I, I'm expecting to come up with a number of a $2.5 trillion budget deficit for this uh, fiscal year. So we'll, I want to explain that um, and have enough time to do it. And that's why we're skipping over the um, exchange rate issue and moving straight to policy. Okay, well, I hope you're doing okay there and uh, at home. And uh, try to organize yourself so you can kind of stay up. All the teachers are trying different ways to scramble around and meet our requirements. And I realize for you that's got to be frustrating because everybody has a different way that they're trying to reach out to you. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible by leaving these archives here so you can come and address this in Econ 53 just like you could when the class was in session. Uh, the normal way. You could go look up the lectures anytime you want. Okay, we'll talk to you very soon. Hang in there.